Welcome one and all to the Ferret and Raccoon podcast episode 186. I am your one and only host for this podcast, The Angry Raccoon, bringing you the last podcast of February 2022. And it has been a rough couple of weeks and a rough couple of days in the world as we know it, unfortunately. For people who are maybe listening to this in the future, they probably don't know what exactly I'm talking about. And usually on these podcasts, I try and keep it about media and entertainment and trailers. And we kind of look at these and criticize them and I give my opinions on them. But I think I'm kind of going to have to break a bit of a rule I have with this podcast where I don't necessarily talk about religion or politics or world news and actually address the facts, the very scary and very unfortunate fact that over the last few days, as at the time of this recording, um, Russia has invaded Ukraine for reasons that I'm not entirely sure why, mainly because I do not follow news outlets because I don't trust a lot of news outlets. I don't know all the facts, and I'm not going to go into all the details. I do know that this is something that has happened, and it has affected and threatened millions of people's lives, and it's honestly quite hard to talk about. It's something I haven't really, you know, verbally talked about at all. It, it has had a negative effect on my life, as I'm sure it's had a catastroph- catastrophic effect on many other people's lives, those who are living in Ukraine, those who are living in Russia. But the fact that Russia themselves, or more accurately, their government, has decided to invade their country and terrorize them is just unspeakable in some sense it's i'm actually really heartbroken by the fact that this is something that is happening and the fact that this is something that has happened i mean i'm sure i've probably brought the podcast down to some extent and even just the matter of fact of this happening has put a bit of a strain and kind of put a limitation as to what i can actually write and how i've gone about my day because my thoughts are with those affected both you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, mentally, f- both in Ukraine, the good people who, because there are good people in Russia, it's not the country itself, it's, you know, their political leader and, you know, their, you know, the people who do follow his regime, you know, my heart does go out to these people who are affected. And I know there are people here who, you know, do know people, do have families in both these countries who, I'm sure must be just going through all the emotions right now. And me, myself, I'm going through emotions despite not having, you know, any real connection between these two countries. It's shocking that this has happened. And I'm sure the rest of the world can agree that this is just something that is just super unfortunate. I mean, I'm trying to explain my thoughts and yeah, it's a little tricky and I don't really want to ramble on too much. I mean, if I were to give a little bit of my opinion and advice to anyone who I guess is within this country or who isn't within these countries or I guess just to anyone and that is um, to try and stay off Twitter. Now I'm not going to go into a rant about you know how awful that platform is but I will say this, Twitter will tell you whatever it needs to in order to keep you on that platform for as long as possible. If you are a bit worried about the current state of this war, as they want to call it, I would advise and recommend maybe coming off Twitter for a little bit because misinformation, you know, will spread fast on that platform. Twitter will promote it. It has happened already a few times. I won't mention what exactly it is, but yeah, fake information and misinformation does spread very easily on that platform. So for a little bit of peace of mind, I would say maybe come off that platform and maybe just try and live in the real world for a little bit. It might help. And hopefully this current situation that's going on in the world between these two countries is resolved and there is some kind of happy ending, hopefully, um, by the time I do the next podcast. My fingers are crossed, my thoughts and my prayers go out to everyone who has been affected. But I we I am going to move on with this podcast and I'm going to try and give you the normal energy that I usually bring to each podcast. But if that is not possible or if you feel like I haven't delivered that, then I'm going to apologize for now. Um, but yeah, 
yeah, I'm I'm deeply, you know, heartbroken about what's happened, but I am going to continue with the podcast and hopefully this podcast itself can be of some help or escapism to anyone who is, you know, a bit upset at the moment. But other than that happening in the world, it has been a quite eventful couple of days and weeks. I know a lot of people are um, currently hyping and playing the brand new From Software game, uh, Elden Ring, I believe is what it's called. I don't actually know that much about this game. When I talked about it last year on the podcast, that was my first time really experiencing it. And ever since then, I've not really looked into it. I haven't seen any gameplay. I don't know what it's about. I do know that people are very excited to play it and hopefully they are enjoying it and they've got the game they wanted to. And I know that there are plenty of people who... Um, either just can't beat the game or just despise the franchise for its hype and attention who are saying it's the worst game that's just how it goes but yeah um, yeah I think the biggest game of the year has already been released and yeah like I said before hopefully everyone who's playing it and been waiting for it gets what they wanted um, other than that in terms of my life um, I was off for a couple of days which was nice and I was able to catch up on uh, several things, mainly from last year, but a few newer ones as well. Uh, the first thing I finally managed to do was I beat Hitman from 2016. This was the one that was originally episodic, and it's actually almost taken me a whole year to beat this game for various reasons. I have mixed feelings on this game. I think it's brilliant in some places, and I think it's just just not that great in others. There are some levels that I straight up just do not like, but then there are other levels that I really, really enjoy, and I think they are, like, brilliantly designed, and they just play out so well with so much variety and just so much creativity. I don't really know what to think about this game. I do own the second one in this uh, more recent trilogy of Hitman games, and I imagine the second one is a lot better. They kind of iron out the kinks and perfect the formula in this one, I'm guessing, but yeah, I wouldn't say I regret playing this game or that I think it's bad. I'm just a bit mixed on it. But yeah. Um, other things I've done this week as well. I managed to finally watch some anime as well. I finally caught up on the uh, animated and manga series uh, Demon Slayer. I watched the Mugen Train arc slash film as well as season two, which is also dubbed as the Entertainment District arc. Um, both of those were fantastic, in my opinion. I really enjoyed them. I actually like the uh, Entertainment District art a little bit more than Mugen Train. Um, but yeah, I'm finally caught up. If you haven't watched Demon Slayer, it is an anime series. Um, no matter where you stand on anime, that I think you would actually really enjoy. Um, I think it has some really great universal appeal. And I think overall, the production and everything that goes into making this series is of top tier. I think it's one of the... I think it deserves uh, the acclaim it gets because when you look at certain aspects of it and, you know, the technical side of it, it's just really well done. I, I, I mean, if you're a bit on the fence of it and you just think it's like hyped up, you know, I would say at least give it a chance. I think it deserves at least that. Uh, and the final thing I did over the last two weeks is actually one of the newer things, despite the fact the film actually came out last year, is I watched the animated film Bell which is directed by the same director who, I cannot remember his name right now, he's the same person who did The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, Summer Wars, uh, Mirai, um, I think, yeah, Mirai was the last film he did, Wolf Children, just to name a few, so he is a filmmaker who, you know, you should be aware of if you're a fan of Japanese animation or anime, and yeah, I absolutely loved this film, I thought it was fantastic, it is technically fantastic in the visuals and I think what he did with this film without spoiling anything because it is a very new film um, I really appreciate and I really like where the film went and what it did and what it told it's certainly I guess to some extent in scale one of his smaller films but I think that works to the film's benefit for a lot of reasons which I won't say if you can get the chance to, to watch this film in UK cinemas, try and do that. Try and support this film. I think it deserves your support. If not, please add this to your watch list because I think it's a fantastic film that deserves the attention or even more intention, uh, attention that it's... Or I can't even say. Basically, go watch the film is what I'm really trying to say. But um, that's kind of the last few things I've been doing over the couple of 
days. I am back to work now, and that's uh, been a bit tricky to get back to because my workplace is very loud, and having a week off in a nice quiet room has definitely, it definitely took some time to get used to. But let's move on to some news stories. I'm going to talk about other things that happened over the last fortnight. Um, The first, more unfortunate news, is the fact that Nintendo is going to be uh, discontinuing the Wii U and Nintendo 3DS eShop for absolutely no reason. They didn't really give a justifiable reason as to why they're doing this. I think they're just doing this because they're old. This is inexcusable. I mean, sure, they've learned from past mistakes and they're informing us about this and giving us at least a year to download and buy these games before they're potentially gone forever, but it's still unnecessary for them to do this. Like, I I really, I I don't get it. Like, I understand that, like I previously said, the Wii U and the 3DS aren't, you know, current anymore and, you know, people aren't really making games for them, technically, although I did remember seeing that there was one game that's going to be released physically for the 3DS, as it was the last official, officially certified game to be released by Nintendo. I don't know what its name is. I tried to find it, but I, I can't find it. I don't know if that's true, but I just wanted to, you know, let you know that they are still making games for it, despite, you know, there not being, you know, a mass amount of games coming out back in the heydays of both those consoles. The thing I don't understand is why they're not moving or combining the Wii U and the 3DS eShops into the Switch eShops. I mean, that might be their plan to do later on, but it's incredibly frustrating and like damaging for Nintendo to reveal this like negative information with no silver lining. I mean, at the time of this recording, they have stated that we currently have no plans to offer classic content in any, well, in other form, in other ways. That's essentially what they've stated on their website. You know, they're literally saying, no thanks, we don't want your money. Which is incredibly bizarre, for especially when companies just do that full stop. Um, here's the situation. Essentially, Nintendo has made it acceptable to pirate their games. If they are not going to provide a way for people to buy their games, then it's perfectly okay to pirate them. That's kind of unfortunately been the moral stance with a lot of things within media. If you're not going to provide a way for me to buy it, I have the right to illegally download it. And plenty of people, myself included, have things illegally downloaded um, simply because the people who own it don't release it or at least haven't re-released it. Um, I mean, there's plenty of things I have that I would love to physically own. I'd love to buy regardless of whether it's digital or physical. And yeah, it's not provided for. I think that's ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's it's weird. It's weird because Nintendo hates piracy and they have actively made like a reputation for themselves by handing out like cease and desist letters to people like archiving their games via websites, people creating like fan games based on their IPs, mods within said fan games and you know that kind of stuff. And even in a few cases, they've even handed out these letters to like online artists like people who do like you know both safer work and not safer work artwork it's a bit ridiculous this is a fact that's not well documented because these um artists are a lot smaller than let's say a person who had a website archiving games or someone making a fan game they didn't have as big an audience and obviously news articles aren't going to you know write you know anything about that because it's not going to get them as many clicks Um, I know a lot of information about this matter, um, so if you do want to know more about this, please let me know, and I could possibly do some kind of follow-up on some more research just to, you know, put this more, uh, put this information more out there. I mean, people are willing to buy their games, and if they're not going to preserve these games, we will, or other people will. That's something Nintendo still doesn't seem to understand, that where we and other people are not maliciously trying to destroy Nintendo. Like, I get it. Piracy is bad. No one wants what they've created to be out there and for people to be obtaining it for free. I get that. And if someone is illegally doing that, yeah, take them down and, you know, tell them to stop. But once again, if you're not going to do anything about preserving things, then people will take matters in their own hands because guess what? People who like video games... 
they're quite passionate about them, okay? I mean, I would like to be playing games that came out today, 30 years from now, much as I'm sure there are people who want to play games that came out, you know, 20 years ago that they want to be playing today. Um, it's just really weird. And I mean, adding insult to injury by doing this, you know, or essentially giving us no option or removing a massive option, this will increase piracy of their games and the price of these physical games will skyrocket because they'll become sought after. I mean, it's just, it's not common sense in some sense. And uh, the one thing I want to end on before, before I move on from this section is the fact that the Video Game History Foundation um, themselves have made a comment regarding uh, Nintendo's uh, situation or their actions. Um, which I am going to read because I think it is quite interesting. Uh, I'm going to try not to butcher it. So, uh, according to them, well, not according to them, their statement on the matter is, and quote, while it is unfortunate that people won't be able to purchase digital 3DS or Wii U games anymore, we understand the business reality that went into the decision. What we don't understand is what path Nintendo expects its fans to take, should they wish to play these games in the future. As a paying member of the Entertainment Software Association, Nintendo actively funds lobbies, lobbying that prevents even libraries from being able to provide legal access to these games. Not providing commercial, co excuse me, uh, commercial access to is understandable, but preventing institutional work to prevent to preserve these games, these titles, on top of that, is actively destructive on video game history. We encourage ESA members like Nintendo to rethink their position on this issue and work with existing institutions to find a solution. Yeah, you know, to have a company that is actively trying to preserve video games as an art form and for people to enjoy and play for them to state that definitely has you know obviously they're a bit upset about that i would be too if my whole livelihood was trying to protect something that nintendo seems to not care about but yeah i will leave uh, nintendo's statement or post regarding their closure of the e-store as well as um, the foundation's uh, tweet if you want to go and read that and I guess go and follow them and support them but uh, let's move on to some other things as well uh, sticking with gaming for a little bit and the next one is going to be Capcom revealing Street Fighter 6 which kind of just came out of nowhere to some extent they did say there was going to be a announcement a little while ago there was a countdown for it I was honestly hoping for Resident Evil information the Resident Evil 8 DLC it didn't happen I'm not upset. It's going to happen eventually. I can wait. Um, but right off the bat, I will say that I'm not a massive fan of the um, Street Fighter series. I like a lot of the characters' designs, you know, even though most of them are just ripoffs from other media. But this was a nice teaser and a showcase as to what this game might look like. I mean, the character models looked really good, and there were some fantastic details in this trailer, like Ryu's like veins bulging, and like the look of the realistic sweat on his body. If this game is gonna use the RE engine, this could be a real game changer for fighting game for the fighting game genre. Um, I love the fact that they, or well, not they, but I guess I like the fact that they've reincorporated to an extent that kind of like ink paint effect style that. I guess was prominent from about 4, and it was in 5, but they weren't really visually, like, prominent compared to 4, in my opinion. Like, I went back and looked at some gameplay of 5, and yeah, they're kind of there, but they don't seem to be as striking or as, like, you know, like I said, prominent as they were in um, 4. Um, I hope this game is a massive improvement of 5, though. Uh, for its launch, it needs to be a full roster or at least a big roster. We can't do what they did last time where it was, I think, I think there was like maybe three or four characters when I guess five launched and then slowly but surely they released more characters and even then I would, I'd still say the roster in five was poor. Um, no, it, they need to do what Tech and Tag Team Tournament did and just give you like 30 characters off the bat. I know they want to kind of keep the game ever fresh. They want it to have players come back and keep people waiting for their favorite characters or new characters and keep the hype going. But 
that's not going to work. Capcom has too much of a reputation for constantly just messing around when it comes to Street Fighter. So, yeah. Uh, fingers crossed for this one. Uh, the next one I want to talk about, I think this is more significant than Capcom uh, announcing Street Fighter 6, and that is Capcom announcing Capcom Fighting Collection. This is a celebration or a collection celebrating 35 years of Capcom fighting games. Now, I'm actually hyped for this. I don't care about the online play with these games. I want to have these games physically. I want to play them. I just want to know that these games are, you know, there. I can do something with them. I can enjoy them. I can look at them to an extent. Um, and I love the fact that these games are either obscure or rare. Uh, for example, the collection contains Vampire Hunter 2 Darkstalkers, as well as Revenge... Uh, screw it. I completely butchered that. Sorry. It contains um, Vampire Hunter 2 Darkstalkers Revenge and Vampire Savior 2 The Lords of Vampire. The Darkstalkers franchise is really weird and really confusing because it has like three names. As I've just mentioned, it's known as Vampire, it's known as Darkstalkers and Vampire Hunters. Um, those two games I just mentioned, they this is going to be their first time released outside of Japan, as well as Red Earth. This was a fighting game that was only playable via arcades, and this is the first time it's going to be released outside of arcades, and this is the game I'm the most excited for. If you've seen Red Planet, um, Red Planet, Red Earth, excuse me, uh, you'll know why. It looks like a fun game, but yeah. Um, I can't wait to get this. I know it comes out in, I believe, June, July, and it is going to be getting a physical release on Switch and PS4. So, yeah, I can't wait for this. Um, it's, like I said, I'm not a massive fighting game fan. I'm more of a appreciator. I love the aesthetic. I can play them, but, you know, I'm not, like, hardcore or anything. So, this is a big deal to me. Uh, next trailer, and the final one we're going to be talking about regarding video games is the announcement trailer for Shin Megami Tensei Soul Hackers 2. This is another reveal that just came out of nowhere. This is a pretty de big deal for a lot of fans, and myself included, as this is a sequel to the 1977 game of the same name, and it's one of my favorites in the series. Uh, it was originally ported to the PS2 or PS1, or I should actually say first, it was originally released on the uh, Sega Saturn, then ported on the PS1 in 1999, and then again on the 3DS in 2012. I've beaten and owned a physical copy of this game on 3DS. So yeah, if you want to play this before the next one comes out, you best start looking for a copy, because I bought my copy on 3DS, brand new, and I don't see it anywhere nowadays. Yeah. Um, talking about the game itself... <laughs> Um, it's clearly taking a lot more influence and inspiration from the Persona series, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, the Shinigami, Shinigami Tensei Five uh, did it a while back. Uh, well, yeah, they did it a while back, but uh, at the same time, um, the series did it while keeping the core of the main line numbered series. And besides, the structure and format just works. I mean, it's a, an aesthetic and a way of how these games play that people generally seem to enjoy and it works for a lot of people getting in you know more casual audiences as well as appeasing the old school fans um but yeah i really like the character designs in this uh game they're a lot more vibrant and they lean a little bit more towards like a sort of anime style which is fine um the general aesthetic of the game looks fantastic though i i'm I, i'm just really well, yeah, as you can tell, I'm a little bit speechless just how good and how stylistic this game looks. I mean, I'm loving the use of neon and fluorescent lighting, and there's just a lot to really like about this game. I really do hope that it, I guess, continues to keep the Shinigami Tensei and Persona fans happy, as well as hopefully bringing in some new ones, and maybe they'll do some, um, some like, expanding to some extent, but yeah, I can't wait for it. Um, let's move on to films, and the first trailer we're going to talk about with films is going to be for Jordan Peele's Nope. Now, uh, I didn't talk about this on this last, I didn't talk about this on the last podcast because I was not about to wait around for the actual trailer to drop. I got the podcast done before then, I just, it was a sacrifice I made, simply put, and Having watched the trailer, I love the fact that they hyped this trailer up with a reveal trailer. And once the official trailer was released, they basically showed us nothing. 
resulting in people hyping the film up even more and leading us to speculate even further. I'm just going to say it, this is how you make a trailer. Everything about this trailer was great. It did what it needed to do and it did it well. I'm already loving the vibes of this film. Focusing on like one location, presumably in the middle of nowhere, with a monster that only poses a threat to a few to these few characters. I mean, that's classic horror right there. Because they're on their own as well, no one's going to help them, so it creates more terror. Also, this threat, I guess to some extent, it's only affecting this town, but it also adds like another level of fear and danger because you could easily this could easily become a widespread you know, situation across the world, you see what's happening to this small defenseless town and you immediately go, oh snap, this could happen to the rest of the world or it's going to happen to the rest of the world depending on where this film goes. Um, I guess we will just talk about the more obvious factors in this trailer because, yeah, this trailer is way too just bizarre to really, you know, state what is happening. Uh, it seems like the threat might be aliens which, you know, sure, okay, whatever. The trailer hints towards that, but I feel like something bigger than aliens invading and taking over is going on here. The aliens themselves seem to be like short, bug-eyed, like, creatures. Essentially the generic look we've established for aliens, which is really interesting. I mean, there is a shot in the trailer of a pile of these toy aliens, and it does make me wonder if the aliens themselves are trying to blend in rather than invade. Like, maybe they can take on different forms, and like, maybe their whole plan is to like, replace people to some extent. I mean, you do see a woman with a sun hat like, looking up to the sky, and her face isn't really human, like, I don't know what that's about. Like, I've looked at the scene, and I'm sure everyone's used it as the thumbnail for the trailer and all that. Obviously, because of the way it's shot, I have no idea what's going on. I can't really figure out what's going on, but her teeth are, like, large, and she does like I said, she doesn't look human. I don't know what's going on. There are tons of theories and speculations as to what is going on in this film. Some I think are a bit silly, some I think are legitimate to an extent. Um, my prediction is that is maybe an alien, that woman, or you know, something, something's happening to her or something's going to happen to these people. I don't know. And even the fact that you see that big cloud slash that hole in the sky, that could easily be, you know, the spaceship in disguise. So it seems that whatever's happening, it's, it's weird because there's another shot where you do see like an alien, like, you know, just see the top of its head. And I'm just wondering, like, why go through all the trouble of hiding yourself, especially your spacecraft and all that other stuff if you're just going to be out there in the open it's fucking bizarre um there are a lot of amazing and frightening scenes in this trailer i mean i've already talked about the scene with you know the the short alien behind the whatever i mean there's another really interesting shot where you see like you know the the hole in the sky that's pretty awesome how the lightning just reveals that and you see the um carnival string coming out of it which is another weird detail like what's up with that like has something been sucked up there and it's just you know they haven't thought to remove it I, I don't know it's weird a lot of really odd and striking shots even just the shots of like people looking up and you don't see what they see and just you know I know there's another really just odd shot where the guy just you know slumps over and falls off his bike it's it's really weird it's really weird but I mean I know that Jordan Peele likes to have like multiple themes, context, and social commentary in his films, and I hope that he hasn't gone over the board with potential metaphors in this film, and that there is, because there is a danger that if the aliens do look silly, and that the twist reveal is stupid, that could destroy the film. But having said that, he's one of the only few directors taking risks and making original films, and for that fact alone, I'll be supporting this film and watching it because it looks pretty awesome. Uh, next trailer I want to talk about is a big one. It's a really big one. Um, and that is going to be for uh, Chippendale Rescue Rangers. This is the teaser trailer for it. And um, I did hint towards the fact that when this trailer did eventually drop, I was going to have a lot to say about it. And that time is now. Um, I'll start with the good. 
to an extent. I like the fact that characters appear and are presented in a different animation style based on the era from which they came from, and or it looks like they were taken right out of their respected series, giving this film somewhat a somewhat level of continuity that they all exist in the same world slash universe. Although, the fact that some characters look more, look, move and animate differently from others also destroys the continuity at the same time, as it's technically and stylistically clashes. It's a ten it's a mm, it's essentially a technical and stylistic clash of visuals that I would argue is overstimulating, inconsistent and messy for the most part. Uh, for example, Roger Rabbit, who does appear in this film for some reason, his colours are incredibly dull compared to the My Little Pony characters, and yes, there is a difference in error, at least about 22 years apart from My Little Pony and Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but these characters all exist in the same world and universe. Why do they all look drastically different? I mean, there is no consistency. In Who Framed Roger Rabbit, all the characters look like they belonged in this world, or in that world, more accurately. That's because they were all animated in the same way. Even Space Jam, a film that I think Disney is clearly trying to reference, um, you know, understood this. They, you know, have consistent animation. Everyone looks like a cartoon from the same world. The, the issue is, when you go about referencing animation that is decades apart from each other, uh, in an attempt to like be faithful or be referential or whatever, you end up with characters that awkwardly stand out and the believability is gone. All you're left with is an outdated and ugly film because I'm sorry, this film looks awful. It looks ugly. I'm sorry. Like, it, it's not great. Like, it looks cheap. I'm sure it didn't have the biggest budget in the world, but it's just so bizarre. Um, the only other thing I guess I will give this film anything is the fact that Dale is CGI and Chip isn't. Well, Chip is CGI. He is essentially a 3D model with cell shading layers slapped onto him, but whatever. Um, it's a decent idea and the joke about it being plastic surgery is an okay parallel to some extent. You know, that's clever to an extent, but I wouldn't say it's brilliant or interesting because I know they're not going to do anything with that concept. But like I've already said, it's distracting and inconsistent. Um, yeah, for the two main characters to look so drastically different. And what doesn't help is the fact that they don't sound like Chip and Dale. Like, I know that in 2022, high-pitched voices could be considered outdated, hard on people's ears, and that they would immediately be compared to Alvin the Chipmunks. But if this film was a true sequel or continuation like they claim, they should have high-pitched voices. But I'm sure they're going to make an awful joke about that in the movie because the creators are so clever and so meta. Which, once again, brings me to one of the biggest problems with this film and this trailer, is that it is trying way too hard to be meta, to be surreal, and to be referential. I mean, this is basically Disney's second attempt at having their own Ready Player One, Space Jam 2, Who Framed Roger Rabbit type film. The first attempt being Bracket Ralph 2, Who Breaks the... Uh, who Breaks the Internet? <laughs> uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet. Uh, in this film, it's too much. It's just a constant barrage of reference after reference after res reference. It's tiring. This film trailer was exhausting. I don't know what to concentrate on or what to really think about this. Like, nothing in this trailer is clever or funny. They're just relying on references and commentary and in hopes of that's going to sell the film. And sure, it's going to win some people over. It did with the fourth Matrix film, but... There's only so many times you can do that. I want a story. I want a film, not just a bunch of references. This is not a film at the end of the day. This is an advertisement for Disney, given some of the scenes and some of the things they're showing off. And I guess it brings me to another big question, and that is, who is this film for? Because it's not really for fans, because it has nothing to do with the series. It's not a continuation from the original cartoon. It's not evolving the series, it's merely referencing the series. Like, it, the fact that it's called Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers is bizarre. You could have called it anything, and it would have still 
made no sense or had as much to do with Chippendale as if you called it Donald Duck to an extent. I mean, it plays the theme song, you see merchandise, and it really tries to manipulate with your with your nostalgia. And it's honestly not doing anything new. Case in point, in the trailer, uh, they're, origin- they, they're in their original outfits. And the film feels the need to pan over to show you that they ran through an Indiana Jones prop section of wherever they are. And it, push- and it proceeds to play the theme song. Like, why? The fact that this scene is even in the film just goes to show you that the people, um, not the, sorry, it just goes to show that the makers are only interested in making their film as referential as possible. Any fan of the original series knows that Chip's outfit is based on Indiana Jones, and I would bet you even that people who have never seen Rescue Rangers or seen these characters before would automatically assume that he's a reference to Indiana Jones. You don't need to stop the film to make that reference and high-five yourself proclaiming that you, you're being faithful. Being faithful would be continuing such rebooting the series like Disney did with the DuckTales back in 2017. Essentially, that series stuck to the core of the original while also expanding on it, ultimately doing their own thing, their own original thing, um, as the series went on. And with that kind of thing, or with their success... Also, while, you know, uh, doing your own thing and expanding on it and kind of, you know, if done right to an extent, um, as previously mentioned, you'll be keeping your old audiences while also bringing in a new audience. It's just so bizarre. And I mean, Chip and Dale are not even the catalyst for this type of film. In my opinion, and I'm going to get a little bit creative here, it should have been about Mickey Mouse. You should have had the film focus on Mickey Mouse. And here's my pitch. Call the film The Mouse. It's coming out in 2025. Have it reference the fact that Mickey Mouse is one of the most recognizable icons of all time. Everyone in the world knows who he is. And the trailer or the film shows him just sitting on his sofa, slumped in a lazy position, watching TV. He looks washed up despite the fact that he's wealthy. The film could stress the fact that despite his fame, He's not really popular right now. Like, honestly, think about it. When was the last time you saw Mickey Mouse? Like, really think about it. When was the last time he was in anything that you remember? Exactly. He's only really in just one Disney Plus cartoon called The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse, and even then, no one's really screaming about that show. The plot could easily revolve around the fact that he's, you know, broken up with Minnie Mouse, and he wants to get his legacy back. Disney has the power and the money to take that kind of risk. I mean, heck, I'll direct and write that film for a fraction of the film's budget, and it'll be infinitely better than what this is. Um, And the last thing I want to say really quickly before we, you know, talk about the last trailer is they weirdly didn't show Gadget in the trailer, Gadget Hacker Wrench, who is the female mouse character. I'm only saying this because I'm sure there are people who've never seen Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. I'm honestly terrified to see what they've done to that, to her character, and I'm going to make a prediction. I think they're either going to scream about the fact that she's now a strong independent female, despite the fact that she was, and kind of was more of an original, um, you know, independent female character in the series, or they're going to make her a social justice warrior. I'm guessing where she is will be a big reveal, and I'm sure it's going to be the most hilarious thing ever. Because, as we all know, the creators of this film are just so funny, and they're just so meta, and they're just so clever. Clearly, they must be, given that they've made such an awful trailer. Um, I'm actually kind of glad that people who are more invested in animation, cartoons, and the legacy of the series are not really buying into this trailer, because it looks awful. And um, I haven't really mentioned it before, but uh, Chippendale Rescue Rangers is one of my favorite cartoons of all time. I love it. I think it's uh, a fantastic series. Sure, it's an older series, but it's something that I could happily watch today. And to see them, I guess, just drag the characters, drag the franchise, and really try and take advantage of people's nostalgia in such a manipulative and disgusting way is really disheartening. The next time I'm going to see 
or see or talk about this film will be on the end of the year podcast when it is obviously on my worst films of 2022 because that's ultimately its only fate at the end of the day and the last trailer i want to talk about is going to be for the boys the boys uh, based on the comic book series and the, I guess, Amazon live-action series, uh, The Boys Diabolical. They finally released a official full trailer for this. They weirdly released a bunch of, like, teaser trailers, just showing off clips and scenes, but we finally have a little bit more to chew on this time, and I'll say this right now, I'm yet to watch The Boys. People say it's good, and the only thing I know about it is that it's based on the original creator, who I believe is uh, Garth Ehrens? Ehrens? I'm not quite sure how you say his name. Uh, Hatred for Superhero Comics, which has me very interested. But this animated series seemingly taking place in the boys' universe is absolutely insane. I'm actually really excited for this series, despite not knowing anything about this series, or even if this series has context within the uh, live action series of the comics um as it seems like various people are going to be like drinking the substance and getting superpowers which is a great concept for an animated anthology series like it just invites creators to experiment and for people to just literally go wild i mean they can literally do anything with a premise like that and hopefully that's what this series is going to be of course i am in love with the various um uh, art styles and different animations and directors particularly the one with like the baby that has like laser beam vision i don't know what the hell's going on there you know it kind of has like this like classic dr zeus style meets the looney tune style next to the more like anime inspired episodes it just adds to the variety and i know and knowing that people like justin Rowland of rick and morty solar opposites fame uh, seth rogan's uh, aquafina and Garth Evans himself, the creator of the series, the fact that they're going to be writing episodes only has me even more hyped for this series. I mean, I'm already in love with like the tone and the creativity, and hopefully it'll be as violent and, and as hilarious as the trailer seems to lead on. But yeah, that is pretty much going to be this podcast. I kind of went uh, much longer than I uh, originally anticipated, but yeah, there was unfortunately a lot to talk about and a lot to unpack. But I am going to leave you with the video of the episode, which is going to be from the band Turnstiles, who are a band that Ace, Ace Enigma of the f podcast itself, actually told me about. And I've been really enjoying their stuff. So uh, this is uh, for a new song, music video they've released for Underwater Boy. Um, hopefully you guys enjoy this. Hopefully you guys enjoy the artist. Um, at the end of the day as well, given the current situation of things right now, I just want to say to everyone, uh, please stay safe. Um, please be aware of your mental health and your physical health. I know things are just really wild right now, but make sure you look after yourself and your loved ones, your friends, um, and your co-workers as well, because you never know what is affecting them and what they may be experiencing right now. But on that note, I guess I'll end this podcast like I always do by saying I was the angry raccoon and I will see you on the next podcast.